Hey everyone, this is Reagan Canope. Welcome back to the Oregon Bridge. COVID spending, redistricting, racial unrest with George Floyd, like one tumultuous experience after another. And yet I believe really strongly to this day that Oregon would be better positioned and better off on the other side of that if our colleagues across the other side of the aisle would have been more responsive to Republican ideas and Republican input during those days. There's just no substitute for actually having the opportunity to make the changes you want to and commit to those changes. Today I talked with Christine Drazen. Uh, right now she's running a new nonprofit called A New Direction Oregon, um, really laying uh, and filling in some of the gaps that she believes exists in um, the infrastructure uh, for the you know center right side of Oregon policy uh, debates. Uh, but she's also the uh, former Oregon uh, House Minority Leader. She was a Republican leader. Uh, in the 2021 long session, took over right after the 2019 uh, legislative session. And uh, she was also the Republican candidate for governor, an extremely competitive uh, election uh, that many national pundits uh, talked about uh, repeatedly throughout the 2022 election cycle. Uh, Glenn Youngkin came to Oregon uh, to some for Christine Drazen. Republican Governor Association uh, spent way more than they ever have uh, in Oregon, she really made that race um, a strong race and a very competitive one. We talked about all those things, how the 2021 session finished up. We talked about redistricting. We talked about the run for governor. We talked about what she's doing next. Uh, I think it was a great conversation uh, and uh, hope you guys enjoy it as well. Now that the legislative session is over, it's time for Oregon's activists, candidates, and political committees to turn their attention to the 2024 elections. With government regulation of political activities becoming more complicated nearly every year, and with political actors increasingly initiating complaints and litigation to achieve political goals, having experienced legal counsel has become critical to success in the political arena. Harang Long PC has represented clients involved in candidate and ballot measure elections for decades. To learn more about Harang Long's political law practice, check out our website at harangue.com. That's www.harrang.com. All right, Christine Drazen, welcome back to the Oregon Bridge podcast. How are you doing today? I'm well. It's great to be back. Yeah. Uh, I say you come back. Um, you you weren't on the podcast with me. You were on our very uh, one of our first 10 episodes. I think you were on the fifth episode ever of the Oregon Bridge with Ben and Alex, and they were uh, interviewing you in the middle of the pandemic um, in the first few months as your time as a House Republican leader in the first legislative session that took place really fully in that uh, COVID era. And um, so I kind of want to check back in on how all of that went. How was your time as House Republican leader? How was uh, the session and and all that? Yeah, it was actually um, a real privilege to be the House Republican leader and have the chance to be able to, uh, you know, serve my fellow Oregonians in that capacity, try to support all the Republicans across the state that had agenda items to move through uh, the legislative process. So that was a real privilege to be in that role. You know, but those days were tough. <laughs> COVID was a complete and total train wreck for Oregonians. The legislature really had a duty and an obligation to narrow its focus in that session where it was closed off to the public and we weren't in person and they declined to do that. And that created a lot of complications. We didn't get as good uh, or strong of policy out of that session, even with the supermajorities that the Democrats um, continued to wield at that point. We need, but we needed the public. We will always need the public. They are essential to our legislative process and they engaged, but it was difficult and halting, honestly. In that session in particular, I mean, I became caucus leader right after the 2019 session. And so we had the short session and we had all of the cap and trade 
drama. And then we went into the immediately into the COVID era. And so my time as Republican leader was cap and trade, COVID, COVID spending, redistricting and the challenges of redistricting. And, you know, over that same period, it was it was racial unrest with George Floyd. And, it, you know, it was like one tumultuous experience after another. It was a very, very complex time to be in leadership. And yet I believe really strongly to this day that Oregon would be better positioned and better off on the other side of that, if our colleagues across the other side of the aisle would have been more responsive to Republican ideas and Republican input during those days. I mean, we were calling for schools to be reopened. Uh, we were calling for uh, restraint on spending in those days. I mean, they were the state was spending like a drunken sailor. And we're now seeing that quite a bit of that spending wasn't spent in a way that had accountability and measures in place for outcomes. But much of that spending was fraudulent and you know, they're now chalking it up to this idea that it had to, that money had to get out of the door so quickly. So there are things that we can look back and learn from during that time. But I would say in the 21 session, I had the opportunity to fight for uh, equal representation on the redistricting committee. That was very important to our caucus. That was our number one priority to ensure that Oregonians had a shot at fair maps. And uh, we earned the right and earned the opportunity to be able to have equal representation on that committee. And unfortunately, our current governor, uh, Kotek, made the decision to step out of that agreement and go back on her commitment to us. And we ended up not being able to have fair maps for our state. But in the 21 session, I was so proud of our caucus for fighting that fight and being really focused on standing up for Oregonians who couldn't be inside the state capitol and doing everything that we could to ensure that for the next 10 years uh, that Oregonians had a fair shot in electing their own state representatives. Yeah, the, um, I had totally forgotten about um, specifically with the redistricting, that whole, um, I mean, I think you made that, we'll talk about your governor's race in a little bit. I mean, you made that a point to make sure that voters were aware of the fact that Governor Kotek, now Governor Kotek, reneged on her agreement with with Republicans. Um, and I think that that was, uh, you know, just kind of sort of emblematic generally of how uh, the majority is treated the minority. And, and you see that happen. And that's come up, unfortunately, a lot in recent times. Do you think that uh, this is not a, a question I had prepared, but just one that popped in my head about, do you think that um, Oregonians will have a chance to vote on uh, some sort of change in redistricting to make it more independent in the future? Do you think that's something that uh, Republicans should support? Yeah, as a as a Republican leader, I had legislation to move to an independent citizen commission uh, that could draw the lines for us. I, I don't think elected leaders are able to have, you know, arm's length from those decisions. And they frankly shouldn't be able to draw their own maps. That's always been my position on that. But the proposal that has been that's been floating out there recently for redistricting is sort of, you know, it's got its challenges. It is mm. it is not necessarily a clean proposal for redistricting. And so I would be a little bit surprised given the focus that we all need to have on repealing Measure 110 and stopping tolling and some of the larger issues that are going to come before Oregonians. I'd be a little bit surprised if redistricting is able to make it over the finish line because of that. And I think that if it were a somewhat cleaner proposal for how they structure their commission and kind of who's in and who's out, I think that it could stand a chance of having more bipartisan support than it does. It does have some bipartisan support. And I do think that anything is better than what we have now. To be clear, uh, what we have now is broken. And and any progress towards a better system is still progress. Yeah, absolutely. All right. So I kind of want to, I I'll, I'll think we'll switch gears now. I think you really covered well um, the 2021 session. Uh, the 2022 governor's race, um, you uh, made an incredible run for governor. You made Oregon a competitive state uh, in the gubernatorial arena for the first time since 2010 with Chris Dudley. Um, you you know, convinced donors to invest more than they ever had in a, re a Republican candidate. Uh, what was that experience like to run for governor in a competitive, a really truly competitive, almost nationalized version of an election in some ways? It was a privilege to run for governor. I mean, that race was in so many ways not about me as a candidate as much as it was about Oregonians 
really rising up and saying that they were ready to try something they haven't tried in a really long time and elect a Republican. And so I really view that race as just such a privilege to build the kind of team that could get to that point. And I always I always say I am not in I'm not in this business to lose a little better than the last guy. Uh, you know, if if we want to do the work of serving, we have to win races. This isn't about advancing a philosophical uh, message. This is about being in a position to be able to make a difference, to serve. And so that um, that was the part about, of course, the governor's race. I always say that what, are the, what what's the term? Something like uh, close and close is good enough for horseshoes and hand grenades or something. <laughs> Certainly, yes. certainly not good enough for the governor's race. And so the the fact that we made it competitive um, was really, really due in great part to the team that we put together and just the sheer will of Oregonians to reject the status quo. But but for the next person to win, it has got to be that effort, you know, plus uh, we have got we've got to want it more than the other side. We've got to want change more than they want to hold on to power, and until that day comes, uh, it's it's a, it's a it's a tough it's a tough race. It's it's a tough race to win in Oregon. I wholly believe that it's winnable. Anybody that tells you that there's some version of a ceiling on Republicans um, is just flat wrong. Uh, we we really though do have to do everything right. Plus, we have to. Um, Plus, we really do have to build the kind of coalition that uh, that is able to overcome the challenges with the numbers that we have in our state. And we're continuing to make progress. You know, I mean, we have we've we've narrowed the gap between the Republican and Democrat margin at each each posting. It gets a little bit closer. I think when I ran, it was nine point five percent. And today, I think it's like nine point two, something like that. And um, we have to we have to continue to make gains where we can in that regard. But I just think we have to we have to want to win. We have to want to have change come to our state more than the status quo wants to continue to hold on to power. And we didn't quite get there this cycle. It was an incredible opportunity. It was just a privilege to be a part of that. But it's it's not. uh, There's just there's just no substitute for actually having the opportunity to make the changes you want to and commit to those changes. It's really, it's really got to be at the end of the day about winning the day, and we weren't able to get there in this race. Yeah, it was, it was so interesting thinking back on it. I mean, I was seeing, uh, you know, DGA would make a donation, the Democratic Governor Association, and then RGA would match it or beat it, and then the DJ would be, and it was just going back and forth. And you know, Joe Biden was in Oregon, and Glenn Youngkin was in Oregon. It was just like it was something unique that I think. Um, is is hard to replicate obviously i mean we had um, a lot of governor's elections between dudley and yours and none of them got to that level and so there is that like there you know the option the the opportunity will come again it may not be the next governor's race but certainly the the opportunity will be back um again for republicans and i think that um you know the the better races we run the more we're going to be able to to keep them honest and give them the you know the the opportunity to put their best candidates forward because you know right ultimately we win uh you know we we do better for oregon when all the candidates uh are when both sides are running their best and even with i think you know um a lot of people felt like um not everyone has this but i i did talk to some people who felt like you know the independent kind of minded folks ran their candidate the republicans ran their candidate and the democrats ran their candidate and everyone really put their best into that race. And I think Oregon was ultimately better for it. And, and a lot of the candidates had to take, you know, positions that they, especially on the democratic side, um, which Ben, I'm sure will come on in the next episode and refute, but uh, that, that they wouldn't want to have take otherwise. Right. And so I think that that was, you know, it's super important to have that loyal opposition. Appreciate you doing that. So just to be clear, I didn't want, I mean, I, this is the hard thing for me about all this. I know that there's an upside for Oregon as far as, as you said, keeping them honest. But that's not a substitute for taking power away from people that abuse that power. And for sure. that is my that is my experience, you know, in particular with Tina Kotek. 
she's been running the state since she's been in this role in a way that isn't transparent. I mean, she's running the state. She's continuing the things that Kate Brown was doing, only now she's doing them behind closed doors. And and I think that that isn't responsive to Oregonians. And while while she is, uh, while I respect the office and I'm and I want Oregon's governor to serve Oregonians, I want Oregonians to have better outcomes. Uh, I think that it is I think that it is uh, our obligation and duty to to not give anybody a pass when they go behind closed doors and when they aren't transparent and and when they are misusing funds and when they do have agency heads that have scandals, I think we need to hold them to a higher standard throughout their term, uh, not just say how, you know, that they ran a race that was less extreme than they might have otherwise run. Uh, I think that we need to I think that we need to expect her to do right by all Oregonians. Absolutely fair. So pivoting into kind of what you're working on now, you've got a new um, a new direction, Oregon. Uh, is which is uh, a basically a nonprofit organization that you're you're founded and running. Is that correct? Uh, tell us what that's about. Is that yeah. is that about you know building the platform for Republicans? Is that about holding Democrats accountable? What are what are you using that organization to do, and where do you see it, it playing uh, a role in the the politics of the state? Yeah the the opportunity to be engaged in public policy as an elected. And as a staff person through my life has made it clear that we're missing some key pieces as far as uh, who's engaging in public policy discussions in our state. And so one of the pieces I really felt like was missing really what really isn't is an organization that isn't based on party labels. It has nothing to do with the election itself, but really is out there elevating issues and and ensuring that there is some uh, level of awareness among voters across the political spectrum for what's going on in our in our uh, political life. And in the legislative session, our legislators work really hard to get out newsletters and to get out content into their districts. But the opportunity to really kind of give um, an, a larger, cast a larger uh, vision for and communicate with Oregonians about what's really happening in our state, uh, we have the opportunity to do that right now with a new direction. It is an opportunity to communicate with the Oregonians who engaged um, during our race and after the race and really care about the future of our state. And so we will use this as a platform for Oregonians themselves. It's going to be a platform for Oregonians to say, I'm worried about this in my community. So we went out and we had a conversation with the Lentz Neighborhood Association, and they talked a lot about how they can't even get Ted Wheeler to come into their community and talk with them about the challenges that they face. I mean, a woman was just murdered in the Lentz neighborhood. They continue to face violence. They continue to face, you know, some of the most extreme um, and worst case scenarios for drug use and homelessness in their communities. And they're having a hard time being heard. So it was an opportunity to engage with them. We went to Bend and talked about housing and affordability you know, we will have conversations about education and edu- And frankly, right now, uh, you know, when you when you take a look at what happened at, at the middle school and what's happening right now at the State Board of Education, we are having a crisis in our education community for both the providers that are out there trying to teach our students and the families that are trying to advocate and fight for their kids to get a strong education to see their best futures. Uh, um, and instead, our our school districts are advancing a lot of political ideology, and they are continuing to propose things like, uh, you know, permanently removing our graduation standards, which they suspended during COVID. The Board of Education is talking about permanently removing them. So a new direction uh, will serve as a platform to get that word out to Oregonians and say, now's the time. If you if you want to have your voice heard, now's the time to advocate with the Board of Education. Now's the time to communicate your concerns. And so it's going to be it is going to be a platform for those issues and for Oregonians themselves. And I'm just really excited to to be able to get in the communities and listen to Oregonians themselves and and do my part to be able to make sure that their voices are heard. Absolutely. You brought up uh, Measure 110 earlier in the podcast, and I think um, uh, we're recording this right now as. Uh, the legislative committee 
uh, that was formed by Democrats to address, uh, you know, they call it uh, the addiction crisis. They're trying to avoid making this. Uh, so a little bit of backstory. When you served in the legislature, one of the things that you observed is that when a major ballot measure passes that changes statute, a lot of times they will form a committee for implementation of that ballot measure. And it's because it's difficult to get all the wording right. A lot of times ballot measures are more about the issue in the title than the exact wording. They're limited on single subjects, so you can't always fix everything that you need to. And so the legislature then will, you know, sometimes correctly, sometimes hijack the will of the voters um, mm -hmm. to implement those ballot measures. But nevertheless, there's usually a committee on measure 110. There was no legislative committee for implementation of this ballot measure. It was allowed to go into effect as it was written. And what we've seen, of course, is constant news coverage of overdoses and deaths and the price of uh, fentanyl plummeting and and public use of drugs skyrocketing. Right. And so now that it's become a political liability, Democrats have formed an interim committee um, to, to try to fight back against those headlines. Right. Um, do you think that what would what would you like to see happen with Measure 110? And, and what do you think Oregonians are looking for there? I think Oregonians are experiencing some buyer's remorse because there was such a bait and switch when they supported Measure 110. As you know, they thought that they were supporting funding for addiction treatment. And instead, the measure primarily legalized the possession of small of small amounts of, of hard drugs. And that has meant that police have taken a very hands-off approach uh, when it comes to, to, dealing, to dealing with people that are facing addiction. And so I think that Oregonians are looking for a full repeal of Measure 110. I don't believe that that's what legislators will do. I think that they will likely claim that they'll make whatever modest changes that they think they can get by uh, with politically. And then they'll claim victory and said that they fixed the problem, which in reality will not fix the problem. And so I, I think that what we have right now, and we've seen this in, in recent news stories, I'm sure you've seen the coverage that has said, even the money that's gone out the door for Measure 110 for providers, and that really is the focus when people say, I don't want to repeal 110, they don't want to say they're taking away money from the people that are providing access to treatment and addiction. The challenge we have is that the money that has gone out the door hasn't had the kinds of checks and balances and accountability and transparency that's required for that money to actually get down and serve the people that are facing that are facing substance use disorder. And instead, we have seen them have to claw back money in the millions of dollars from Ontario and Klamath Falls and Portland for treatment providers that have, are given this money but are misusing or misspending this money because they're not prepared to ramp up at the level that that money would have assumed. There isn't the workforce for them to be able to do it. And there, there frankly, um, aren't the checks and balances in place to ensure that that uh, that money is not being misspent. So we have we have the opportunity right now to have like a clean slate and say we need to absolutely double down and and we need to get workforce into this into this field. We need more people prepared and ready to serve those facing facing addiction. And also we need to provide services the moment someone is ready to seek treatment. That's the moment where there needs to be an open door that they can walk through to get the help that they need with fentanyl. It, you can't wait three weeks. It's not heroin. You need you need access to treatment the hour that that person says that they're ready, because if they don't get treatment in that hour, they will be using again. It's the fentanyl cycle. I went to go visit Central City Concern and talk with them about the work that they that they do in that in our urban core in Portland, and they are struggling. They're struggling with workforce. They're struggling with violence. They're struggling, you know, with Having people want to work at their facility, knowing the environment that they're in, they're serving the people that they have, they're on mission to serve, but they need more people willing to do it. And frankly, they need, they need that they need measure 110 repealed. Now they, they will say that they would want that money because they can't do their work. They can't hire the people that they need to serve these populations without a funding source. But you and I both know this, the money was not new money from 110. They, nope. they robbed Peter to pay Paul. And so it's not like it was new money. It was just the political will wasn't there before to pay for these services. The political will should be there now. Oregonians have seen the stark challenges that we have when this is an underfunded system and then you legalize drugs. They know that that's a broken system. So now there should be political will no matter what. I think that if we I think that we absolutely must repeal Measure 110 
Uh, that was a measure that was not passed in good faith with Oregonians. They need to have the opportunity to have a clean slate and approach this issue from the perspective of first serving the people that are facing substance use disorders and restoring law and order and safety to our communities. Yeah, absolutely. Counties talked about, I remember um, that some of the counties uh, made contact with the legislature and they were you telling them, look, Measure 110 took money that we used to try to help with uh, local law enforcement and doing some of that community harm reduction and it, and it moved it away, right? And so it was some of that money that was maybe wasn't obvious to everyone that was helping with it that just made the crisis work. Um, and then I would encourage our listeners to listen to episode 122 of the podcast. Um, from the beginning of September, we had Charles Lehman from the Manhattan Institute talk about um, his, he wrote an article mm -hmm. called This Is Your City on Fentanyl. And it was just a really incredible um, kind of look at Measure 110 on the ground mm -hmm. from an outsider's perspective, somebody who doesn't live in the state of Oregon. And so would really encourage um, listeners to take a look at that. Well, this has been uh, a great conversation. Is there anything else you want to share um, with our listeners in the last couple of uh, minutes that we have left, uh, any issue I didn't cover that that we need to be talking about? So I think I'm just going to tell folks where to go in case they want to sign up and get more information Perfect. on a new direction. And they can sign up for newsletters at, at and-or.org. Uh, and if you follow us on social media, it's a new direction or a new direction Oregon, depending on what platform you're on. And you'll be able to follow along, engage in some of the advocacy campaigns that we are participating in, participate in roundtables, all the all the good stuff that we're going to be doing. We we are we're anxious to engage Oregonians and and to hear from them over the course of this next year or so. And and I appreciate the opportunity to come on and share a little bit about uh, the good work that's that's underway with the new direction Oregon. Awesome. Well, this has been a great conversation with Christine Drazen, uh, former uh, Oregon House Republican leader, candidate for governor, and leader of A New Direction uh, for Oregon. Appreciate your time. Thank you, Reagan.